Hi, I'm Mark Johnson, and today we're going to talk about ionizing radiation. Ionizing radiation is particles or energy waves that have enough energy to liberate electrons from an atom or molecule. And when that happens, this can cause mutations by damaging DNA, or it can cause organic molecules to become free radicals. Antioxidants normally would repair those free radicals, but if the creation of those happens at a fast enough rate, then there may be cellular damage which could cause uh, radiation sickness, death of a cell. If cells die too fast before they can be replaced, then uh, either rapid or slow death can occur depending upon the dose of radiation that you're exposed to. Ionizing radiation includes cosmic rays from space, alpha particles which are protons, beta particles which are electrons, and gamma rays, x-rays, and in general any charged particle moving at relativistic speed. So anything that knocks electrons off of organic molecules can be damaging and is considered ionizing radiation because it causes the molecule to become an ion. Radio waves, microwaves, infrared light, and visible light are normally considered non-ionizing radiation. Um, ionizing radiation is natural, it's ubiquitous in the environment, and it comes from naturally occurring radioactive materials that are produced in the center of the earth and from cosmic rays, which come from space. When cosmic rays intercept uh, atoms in the atmosphere, then gamma rays can be produced, and other particles can be produced secondarily from those interactions in the upper atmosphere. We'll see later that ionizing radiation passes through us constantly, all the time. Now I want to look at some video of atomic bomb testing. This is the kind of thing that scared us in the 50s and 60s. No wonder people built bomb shelters back then in their backyards because we were scared and these types of images made us scared. Let's take a look at some land. Some blasts that were on land in, the, in Nevada. Pretty awesome, isn't it? Now think about this. In that airplane you saw a large device that perhaps looked like a, bomb, a great big bomb that was dropped. The reality is the amount of plutonium that it took to make these explosions would fit inside of a dime. A very, very small amount. Pretty awesome stuff. Okay, those clouds that you saw created by the bomb, the mushroom cloud, ejects or injects, really, filthy, dirty particles that are radioactive because of the bomb into the stratosphere. 
That's over 50,000 feet above the Earth. It's above where airplanes fly. And that comes back to Earth as nuclear fallout. And it doesn't just fall a few miles away from the blast. It gets into the stratosphere and it floats around the whole globe. And then a lot of it is injected back into the lower atmosphere through what is known as the tropopause gap. <clears throat> and that occurs at about the 45 degrees north latitude or near the border of Canada and the United States. And then it spreads out throughout the northern hemisphere. And it pollutes our grasslands, our pastures, our animals eat it, but we eat the animals and it gets inside of us. And that's one of the reasons we don't do that kind of bomb testing anymore. Uh, fallout is the residual radioactive material propelled into the upper atmosphere following a nuclear blast. It commonly refers to the radioactive dust and ash created when a nuclear weapon explodes, but this dust can also be originated in a damaged nuclear plant. Three Mile Island, lucky we didn't have a problem there, but Japan, think of it. And this radioactive dust got in the air and it contaminated land in Japan. And the accident that happened at Chernobyl is another example of what happened. This can contaminate not only soil and air, but water if it gets into the aquifers. When I was working on my master's degree at University of Puget Sound, I got involved in a field project with the Department of Energy, Hanford Works Reservation, uh, specifically on the Arid Land Ecology Reserve, which was a part of the International Biological Program funded by NSF at the time. I lived up on this mountain over the weekends sometimes. I stayed in a Nike missile tube which was adjacent to a backup command center for uh, Nike missiles. I didn't really stay in a Nike missile tube. I stayed in the backup command center bedroom. And um, it was a pretty lonely, windswept place. It was there that I got my, in, my interest in radiation and radiation ecology uh, and the things I'm talking about today. And uh, today, um, this is now called the Dick Fitzner and Lee Eberhardt Arid Lands Ecology Reserve. Uh, Dick and Lee, Lee was my mentor in, in the field there, and, and Dick was a fellow student. Uh, he went to Western Washington State University. Um, Dick and Lee were flying together a few years ago and uh, flew into a, a wall of a canyon when they were following a hawk that had been radio collared. So I choke up sometimes when I think of those guys. In the United States, we have nuclear power plants all over the country. They're all over the world, in fact. This is a map that is maintained and is interactive, somewhat interactive. It, uh, it updates. These yellow spots are Geiger counters, computerized and maintained by volunteers throughout the United States. These emblems are the locations of nuclear power plants. These Geiger counters are here for the purpose of detecting radiation leaks that could happen, like the one in Japan or the one in Chernobyl, or a more minor leak. And this is like a civil defense system. It's uh, radiationnetwork.com. Uh, every couple of minutes, you'll see this flash. And this, these counts per minute from these Geiger counters will be updated. And they're counting gamma rays. They're not counting alpha or beta decays, they're counting gamma rays that could be resulting from leaks of this radiation. Next, I want to take you to Berlin to show you a cloud chamber and so you can see what radiation looks like when it's all around you all the time. Hmm. Okay, we should be able to start it now. This is a diffusion cloud chamber. You can see particle radiation, and that's the thick and short trails are from alpha radiation, and the long and thin ones are from beta radiation. 
It works by creating a large temperature gradient between the bottom and the top by effectively cooling the bottom and heating the top and uh, using alcohol vapors that is usually isopropanol to create a super saturated uh, environment on the bottom while those 12 tracks will be usable much like uh, tracks from planes in the sky. What you can see here is just the natural background radiation that is all around you at any given time. So today there was actually a really cool demonstration of this cloud chamber. So we're going to have radioactive sources inserted to that hole you can see on the top right there. So first of all, here's some lovely Amarisco. You can see the alpha tracks there. It doesn't work so well on that side, but it's still kind of impressive because you can see all of the alpha particles being ejected from that source. Uh, there will be something even cooler later on in the demonstration. It kind of looks weird, sort of like as if they were going towards the source, I believe, because of the vapor going that way. That's kind of funny. But now it's time to say bye bye to the Amorysium, because here comes the radium 220, which is a dot on the heat of thorium 232, and has a half time of have light, sorry, of 55 seconds. That's going to be totally awesome, as we will see in a second. Here comes the container with the holes. Uh, we just need a push to distribute all that radon in the cloud chamber. There we go. Look at all those alpha decays. That's just crazy. Oh my god, I love this. That is so insane. Look at all those atoms decaying. You may notice those V-shaped double alpha decays there and may wonder what the hell that is. Well, the thing is that the dark nucleate of radon 220 is polonium 216 and has a half time of just 0.14 seconds. So you can guess what's happening. Yep, the atom is decaying twice at almost the same time. I think this is the best possible display of half-lives you can get. It's totally awesome. And as the gas spread it um, evenly over the whole cloud chamber, you can see the decays just... So imagine that this is blowing through your body all the time. Of course, not these alpha decays, but the gamma rays, the little tracks that you were seeing initially are gamma rays from background radiation, mostly from cosmic rays from space. We believe that this causes 15% of all cancers. In the next video, we're going to see some examples of natural and radi natural radiation and radiation caused by nuclear fallout that are and have been health concerns and something I think you'll find very interesting, but that'll be a separate video. Okay, just imagine all this is blowing through your body every moment of every day. I should mention also that the lady who was speaking was telling you that the short tracks were alpha radiation and the long tracks were beta radiation. I may have mentioned that these were cosmic rays and they were gamma rays from space. And that's true. Uh, what she didn't explain, and I should, is that this cloud chamber, chamber is made uh, with a fog, it's a fog made from alcohol. And what happens is, like a bullet that goes through the water on TV, um, these bullets or gamma rays fly through this material and they cause condensation of the alcohol vapor. And that causes the emission of alpha particles and beta particles inside that chamber. And that's what we are seeing. But it's actually caused by cosmic radiation.